Hi, Trey. Marcus. <laughs> Hello. Hey, so do you want to be as uncensored as always? Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, so kind of like the idea of this podcast is, um, is to be uncensored in a way, but always with a, with like a positive mindset, obviously. And, um, and also to go into topics that, you know, professional interviews wouldn't cover. Right. 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 So, um, and I really have no, no real idea where we're going to go, but I just like to maybe just start a little bit with reviewing or looking at that, that thing that we have in common, which is like we met via this instrument that we play. Right. And I, right. I got my very first instrument from you and, um, and I, yeah, you have it, right? you have it there. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. That's the one, you know, and it's not too bad. I took the belt hook off so I actually could play it on my lap. Yes. Yeah. No, it was, it was a good instrument for me to do. And, and that's still what I use. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I forgot. Well, I have it. I don't know what to do with it, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. And is that so, right? Was that the, was that the first one? You didn't you didn't get one of the polycarbonate ones. That was the first one. Ah, uh, good for you. Yeah. And um, you know, I I had uh, called you at um, Dreamland Studios in Woodstock when you were there with Sylvian and Fripp. I think I don't I don't know if that was. A rehearsal or if that was the recording yeah of the album. We, we were recording and, and what's also interesting um i don't have it on hand but um i uh had that was um, i want to say we, we were we were frank jolliffe and i were playing around with um uh, cu uh customizing the pickup on yeah. the instrument yeah and we had kind of a couple of failed attempts with uh, e EMG. Is that is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just because the, the the string balance is so over the top on our instruments, mm -hmm. and we couldn't get the EMG right. Like we had made a little lucite plate, and mm -hmm. uh, but I had found somebody. It might have been through even Fraza. I can't remember somebody in Woodstock who was hand winding pickups, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I had just gotten. Uh, the the this pickup that he had made for me uh, and I slid it into my I had the 12 string which is probably why you you got the tip my old 10 string mm -hmm. and I had just started using that new pickup at those sessions mm -hmm. yeah 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 and I, actually, I, I don't I don't know I don't really know whether I totally like the pickup or not, but Bottrell, David Bottrell just got an awesome sound with um, the stick direct mixed with going into the giant SVT amp there. Have you seen it? It's still there. Mm -hmm. and, and I've used it when I've been playing with Jerry recently, that gigantic, enormous thing. And we just like put it in a whole room and turned it up and uh, made it work. So yeah, that's the, that's the, the Sylvian Group sessions there. Yeah, and you you really had that really great sound back then, which was unusual for the instrument. <laughs> yeah, it probably it probably is one of the best. <laughs> it's 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 a pretty pretty best version of the sound, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's really yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, and you know that that was like uh, I think it was maybe ninety two, right? It must have been ninety two because I think I received the stick in early ninety three. Yeah, well, then it must have been rehearsals. Then we were rehearsing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and now, um, like almost 30 years later. Oi. <laughs> I remember you sent me like the first a couple of photos, like Polaroids you sent me on the stick. Your, your, your feet were on those photos, <laughs> your toes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Why wear yeah. shoes, especially if you're in Woodstock? Yeah. yeah. Hey, so, but the, the first time we really met was um, on Bainbridge Island, I think, in mm -hmm. 98 or 99 or I something. Guess, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, I've been trying to relook at some of that timeline because I'm a little confused about what happened when. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I have a kind of, I have, I don't have a totally clear memory of that weekend. I think it was kind of a, it was a little bit stressful for me bringing the stick into the guitar craft context and trying to figure out what the hell to do and how to fit in. And um, what did we do? Did we, did we ever play with the guitarist or were we all on our own? And uh, to be quite honest, I can't remember, but it was, yeah. it was a, a you like, it was a course within a course that you were like doing. With and and Robert was running it. Robert no, was it there. Was not, it was not. It was okay. Not, it wasn't. It was a Robert Seattle. Thing. It was a yeah. Seattle guitar circle. So, yes. so it wasn't as wasn't as high pressure as it could have been. <laughs> yeah. But but uh, yeah. But what I found, uh, what you know, what I still remember was that you showed me, um, which be, the the part that became the base part for a construction of light for the piece. Oh, okay. So I was already. But you called it. You called it. I can't remember. It was Lark's even six or something like oh, back oh, then when you when you right, showed it to me. Right. Um, but but anyway, like what was what was fascinating and coming back to these instruments that we play was that your introduction uh, at the chorus was that you said, OK, I have I, Trey, have no idea how to play this thing. <laughs> and <laughs> and that was that was fascinating, dude. That was like totally unexpected. And but really, um, I, I, I think in hindsight, that was uh, extremely clever and, and it was also true in a way. And it's still, it was it's totally still true. And it's still true for all it's of us still in true. a way. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that was, that was one of the things that um, when I first started playing it, eh, maybe in the first year, um, the, the kind of the big revelation for me was that this is such a new instrument and it's so the articulation is really so unusual and um nobody really knows how to do it yeah there's emmett's little free handbook and there's some good players around but but you know if you just because we both came from different musical backgrounds you know i i, I I was a rock musician, but I also studied classical piano and went, went to conservatory. So if you wanted to play any of these other instruments, there's hundreds of years of, of study and knowledge and, and pedagogy and like people experimenting with how to play it. And you can just slot into that and kind of, you can kind of start at third grade because everybody else is already at eighth grade. And, and we're like not even in, we're not even at pre, we're like preschool we're just like playing around with the, you know it's like we've gotten broken into the physics lab and we're just playing around with the shapes <laughs> you know and so I, I i in fact i even remember and i suppose it's okay to say this stuff now i remember saying in an interview once that nobody's going to know how to play this thing for 50 years and um i got a call from uh emmett's wife like within Three minutes you, can't, you don't don't say that and it's like but you know it's true and 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 where are we now we're close to 50 years no. we're close to 50 years right yeah. what, what yeah. what's what's 71 was the first stick something like yes. right yes you know and and you know what it's come a long way it's come a long way and 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 a lot of it's really because of you um i mean and and a lot of people but um it, it's uh there's still so much to discover and it's it's almost like it's um it's such a specialized instrument and a specialized way of playing but also the the possibilities are so freaking enormous compared to a lot of other instruments that it's both the it's got a blessing and a curse built into it like you you almost need to kind of i mean i don't know how i would recommend people learn to play it and, and I don't know what I'll think in 20 years, but it's almost like you kind of want to get a broad sense of it and then really figure out where you want to specialize. And then maybe once you get kind of decent at that, then branch out again. I, I don't know, you know. I, I think the, the one of the main problems is that <laughs> people don't understand that it actually is a unique thing. Yeah, it's so, not so, like a guitar. No, it's not like a guitar, not like a bass, not like a piano. And, no. and it's not like a flute, you know, it's not like a saxophone mm -hmm. in a way, but, uh, you know, like what the, the solution that I would say that Emma Chapman came up with is to kind of restrict the way that you 
should play it or you can play it and yeah. and what he what he kind of like suggests works and that's that's kind of like that's clever it's a clever thing but then like what i experienced even in the like i had only kind of like known tony who is a real musician use the stick mm -hmm. right and then i had known you play the instrument and you never really went into the into the way that you should play it you just played music on it you just came up with parts that worked and sounded great but when should it. play you mean like the like the kind of the solo approach that well, that well should i know like like this the, the thing to like use three uh three fingers right. and all this, you right. know right. and, and stuff stuff like that and the chord yeah. shapes which there are like four or five really like for the left hand and stuff like that and you never did that and 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 that is uh, you know sort of like coming from more like an ensemble player perspective rather than a solo player exactly yeah and, and and that was also kind of like what I was interested in. But then, um, like actually having getting the instrument, I was absolutely shocked. I remember it was really a shock to my system to realize, okay, like all these dreams I had about it, right? Like what you know, it just doesn't work. It's it's it just doesn't work. Like you know, you can you can imagine it all you want, right? But once you have it in your hands, like things don't work the way you think. Yeah. yeah. And. Um, yeah, and then seeing seeing that people were hitting the ceiling so quickly, like you could have the instrument for a week and you could play everything you were you will be able to play for all your mm. life, mm. and, and that mm. was that was just shocking to me because I I loved the whole idea of it, I loved the sound and everything was kind of like, and so that's why for me it was like I went into research mode right away and said okay mm. like and then uh, finally meeting you and getting input from you was very 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 useful for me. And actually, this uh, uh, what I what I now call the pentachord approach, which you also call the pentachord, is kind of like really is the solution, is the key to at least getting the instrument into to an acceptable level, <laughs> say, mm -hmm. right? And this is kind of like where I'm at and with what I'm teaching nowadays. And you know, just thinking about that, actually, two two things I I, I want to stick in there. You know, what was shocking for me was that when I first picked it up, it was like, holy shit. This is the instrument I should have been playing the last ten years. Mm -hmm. I've been I've been doing all the, I've been trying to do stuff on the guitar and the piano and the bass, and it's the wrong instrument. And I was like, hooray! And then like four days later, I was like, holy shit! Now I see. If you want to play this really well, it's gonna be an insane amount of work. You've got extra fingers, like guitars. You know, you, you, you like all the to be able to do it, and then like to know the fretboard. And there's so many strings, and there's six ways to play a C, the same C note. I was like, oh my God, you know. Um, but... Um, you know, Trey, it was actually this very room I'm sitting in right now because I'm visiting my parents. Oh, so this It's awesome. this very room that I first took the <laughs> instrument out of the case. And <laughs> yeah, give it over. <laughs> I should nail it to you. <laughs> and, and it was it was really this moment, like this is not, this is, has not been made for planet earth that was kind mm. of what i was, think, what I was yeah. thinking so yeah. so yeah. that means yeah. like i well but back then i have to create this alien world around it mm. for it to work and mm. i i spent i had the i i was playing chapman sticks for like maybe five six years and then um you know um i was really fascinated with the eight string war guitar like when you uh, I don't know whose idea that was, but I think that's genius. And I still think that the eight string. It was my genius. idea. <laughs> it's Actually, you know, we were trying to figure out, um, Mark and I were trying to figure out, um, he had come up with some, we're, I'm talking about Mark Warner. Actually, before we go to that, I just want to say, um, when you're talking about the pentachord and how that opened up things, you know, to me, it just occurred to me now, the reason why at least it, it opened how I see it opening up thing. And when we say the pentachord, we're talking about using both hands to play a line on one string. Wouldn't you say that's yeah. uh, the, the thing about that is you've said, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do kind of the, the, um, the boogie woogie ragtime piano approach where the bass is doing this and playing chords and then this is soloing i'm just going to release all of that and just say look let's just look at one string 
both hands on the one string, playing a single line as if I was a clarinet. Yes. And I think that that's where, for me, and I, 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 you probably think so even stronger, that's where the instrument enters into the, the orchestra of instruments. Yes. You know, where, where now it can be, now it can come into um, like a super simplistic scale downness, but also now the potential opens up from a, from a, 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 a like a ground, a solid grounding. Exactly. Uh, otherwise, it's just too much. Like this, this is what you get to maybe after, I mean, what I used to say is like after a hundred years or 200 years, maybe you get to that, <laughs> but you, you've got to just like, how do you, how do the two hands work together? Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. that's the thing. Yeah, exactly. um, so yeah, then, then, then moving on to Mark War, who um, uh, built the instruments that I played after that. Um, we, I, I can't remember how it initially started with the idea of the eight string, but it was, it was kind of like, the instrument had always been stereo with a bass side and a treble side and two different sounds and all this gear and all this, there's like kind of a, it feels like, I don't know, it feels like you're going to a jousting match with a horse and a, a pole and like all this armor and you got to get your, it's like, what? couldn't I just, what would a strip that, what, how do we simplify this thing? And then um we had just kind of uh the six piece crimson had kind of fallen apart and we were just going into this um and i'd be curious now what instrument i played on the very first uh projects but we went into these improvising projects and that's where i started using the really started using the eight string and um the first eight string i mean i have it right here it's pretty cool the first eight string i have them both Yeah, so I guess you're bringing the black one, right? Yeah, the first one was this black one. Yes. And, and the, the black one is the one that I saw because there was a photo of you with that instrument in guitar player or something. Yeah, and it's yeah. it's very cool. And it's, it's um, I don't know what, I think, you know, actually, I think Mark was trying, with this one, Mark was trying to wean me away from the Paduk because it's very difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. and yeah. it's, it's toxic so he has to like cover his whole shop in plastic and wear masks and so he was trying to get me into a swamp ash and uh, body and so we made the the h string and i i loved it and it also had some problems which we've all solved and, and you saw the, the the biggest one is that this the lower string feels like the action is way higher mm -hmm. than the high string because it's so big mm -hmm. and this one also has a pokey sound um which is kind of cool. It's, it's very cool for guitar parts. For bass parts, it didn't really work that well. So then we went to the, this eight string, um, back to the Patuk, and Mark did a, um, he radiused the mm -hmm. yeah. fretboard on the bass side. So that actually the level of the strings feel like it's flat. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, this must have been what I use with the projects because it, it still has the I was using the roll yeah, MIDI. Yeah, yeah, you you did, and that that was also like my instrument that was the sister instrument to yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, it's still pretty cool. Um, <laughs> it's funny. I was talking with somebody about this MIDI thing the other day, and how I'm so glad I don't even bother with it anymore. Um, and it was the, it was quite cool. I mean, I I saw Project One and Project Two at the Jazz Cafe in London, and you used the the MIDI extensively and. Yeah, I yeah. liked it. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just like I simplified the instrument and then complicated the electronics. <laughs> so <laughs> that's like you know, I mean, uh, if anything, I feel like um, I've had, I really had to adjust over time with the fact that the instrument and the tuning and the processing, this just changes. Like every two or three years, it completely changes, and it's, it's frustrating to not uh, um, feel like you just have your instrument and that you get to play it for 30 or 40 years, like a violinist or just like a heavy metal guitarist. They don't have to deal with all this stuff. They just have their vocabulary, they have their guitar, they have their guitar sound, they have their amp. But for, for, for me, it's just changed a lot. And, um, but I found that um, 
the eight string didn't give me the the bass sound that I needed when I was really tracking serious bass stuff. So I've kind of I've gone back to now it's just a ten string. Mm -hmm. And um, but I'm you know uh, I don't know if we've talked about this, but um, I've been in conversation with um, Aaron. I can't remember Aaron's last name. The, the the guy who plays the weird bass instrument in Buke and Gase. Do you know mm -hmm. these yes. guys? And we've been talking about him building me a horizontal instrument because that's how I play horizontally now. And I, I haven't figured out what the string configuration is going to be at first, but it's going to be some more closer version to the eight string. Mm -hmm. It might even just be seven strings. I don't. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And then you know, most people know we play in fifths, so it's it's uh, that's a that's part of the equation. It's, that's part of the equation and also why the two hands work so well. Exactly. Um, in the fourths tuning, um, like Emmett does on the top side, you can do, you can kind of wheedle around on the top side in a, I don't know, more melodically satisfying way than one hand on our instrument. I, I think it depends. Yeah, yeah. But even then, even with that, with that tuning, I think the, the pentachord approach that we already mentioned is, is kind of like superior because you have more control and you actually know where the notes are along the string. Right, rather right, than, right. Rather than thinking positionally. Yeah, yeah. Because as, as I, I have, I, I believe that moving along the string is necessary to actually get a good note, a good tone yeah, out of the instrument. Yeah, get a good sound. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's why, that's why it is, uh, uh, but anyway, like, um, and that's how I think of the instrument anyway, at this point, I, I, I always think, especially once I put it on my lap, I think, um, I don't know what you call it, if it's longitudinally or, or horizontally, but the, the, uh, the, along the length of the string and not across the strings. For me, yeah. I look at it like if I'm playing a 10 string instrument, it's basically 10 instruments. Yes. Yeah. next to each other yeah 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 exactly exactly yeah so um maybe let me jump to to early this year when i started working with uh, sean crowder who's an amazing dude really wonderful wonderful person and yeah. a great drummer and um i had met him at a at a show in berlin uh, maybe a year and a half ago and actually we we met for he's a not he's not he's not german right no, he's American, but he is in Germany. He lives in, he lives he lives in Berlin, yeah. And, nice. and and so, like, we went out, had a drink for drink, and we talked, and, like, we were talking about YouTube and YouTube formats and ideas and stuff, and then, like, I said to him, hey, Sean, why don't you teach me drums and I teach you touch guitar? And that was just, like, you know... But then, it, like, it stuck, you know? And just last year, um, in November, he contacted me and said... Marcus, I want to do it. I want to learn touch guitar, wow. and and so like that's the, that's what we're starting with, and maybe we'll do the Marcus the other drums as well. <laughs> that would be awesome. Well, he um, would be a great guy to learn from. I'd be, yeah. I'd be curious to see how he approaches, uh, kind of the grounding of it, the beginning of it. You know, that'll be really interesting, and and he should do it because he's a great drummer. But if he taught you how to play drums, he would be a better drummer, for sure. Sure, exactly. And that's that's kind of like what I'm also experiencing, like really having somebody who has like no expectation, really, and but great exp you know, experience, experienced learner. Right. And like, it's so funny because like he's he's uh, maybe 15, 16 years younger than I am. And like just from my perspective as an experienced m musician, but really like more in the more in the global sense musician, you're not just like I. It's it's amazing to see how I can get him into a trance by <laughs> saying the things that I say. It's kind of yeah. like it's amazing. Like like even he gets into these woo. What's going on right there? <laughs> but awesome. it's uh, it's fascinating to see that um, like the the concerns that you know both you and I had for so for for decades that it will always take a long time for people to actually get an insight or have an idea of how it may be to play it freely um mm. and he's like in even after three months he's really like just last week we set up um 
a small uh, looper pedal for him and um, so the, well, it, was the, crazy. it was the first time that he was actually improvising on a drone and I let him uh, loop an a, uh, an a or a D or whatever and and he was just playing the white keys right just the C major okay. scale on top of that and I was I have to say that that very first improvisation he did on the drone was beautiful it was pretty amazing like you know just like coming from this little bit of information I, well it's a lot of information but he has had only had three well not even three months to practice mm -hmm. it i think we're we're actually a step further finally finally mm -hmm. and i i'm still hoping for like the the young people i know i mean young like in their teens to pick up the instrument kind of like they come to us they get like all the information we have within like a few months and then they go ahead and they reinvent this whole instrument in terms of painting mm -hmm. that's kind of like what i'm what i'm what i hope will happen right right wow awesome yeah but yeah i, I definitely enjoyed i've only seen a couple of the ones with with sean but um i definitely enjoyed it because it's just so compact with the, in, the info mm -hmm. and, and watching him um you know the struggle for us is like you say it's been decades but to watch him kind of go through the whole struggle in 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 a in a microscope is it's great yeah. yes great yeah so you're um i was thinking if i'm i'm not i i wasn't sure if we should talk about your relationship with robert fripp maybe a little sure. bit because it's also tightly tightly related with your your uh, your journey with the instrument right with the, with the yeah. touch instrument yeah yeah so, so yeah. the the very first um project after say the guitar craft involvement that you had like you were involved in guitar craft um was um the Fripp Fripp band right yeah with yeah Toya. yeah and um what what do you remember about that time um well it was super exciting because I was playing this new instrument that um uh, like suddenly felt like I was at home, mm -hmm. you know, and also, um, I, I, uh, there's such a history to the guitar that just didn't quite suit me. So I kind of had this, 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 I don't know, to have the future of what you can do on an instrument, like wide open was just so great. And then, um, working with Robert, you know, the, 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 and then the drummer, Paul Beavis, the, I, I've just been going through, I've been going through digitizing all my old cassette recordings. And I just finished all the ADATs the other day. Uh, but I actually started with some of these old Sunday all over the world tapes, which what the Frit Frit Bam turned into. Mm -hmm. And the rehearsal, the, the rehearsal writing tapes were, it's just fantastic, uh, fascinating, even before we had Toya in, um, because um, Robert was kind of doing this kind of playing and, and it, it, I don't really know what was going on with him, but it was, it was, um, it was a kind of playing that I don't even know that I, I, I have never heard him do before. And I don't even know that he's done since, and it's not necessarily represented on the record totally, but there was this kind of playing that it had a, it had a, like almost, um, there was a lot of harmonic movement. Mm -hmm which is not really Robert's thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking like kind of, I've used the word traditional harmonic movement in very loosely. It wasn't traditional, but there was just, a, we were moving through lots of different chords and stuff. And um, it, had a, it had a Beatles vibe, the way the harmony was moving so much and not, um, not kind of boxed in, like um, it, definitely like Crimson is very boxed in mm -hmm. uh, harmonically. Um, you know, unless you're talking about a song where Adrian's kind of run with the harmony, but even still, this was even more so. So it was this fascinating kind of discovery. And it was a, it was a weird time because I had been Robert's student on the guitar and now we were playing together. So that was kind of this, um, I think we were both trying to um, kind of unsettle that relationship and figure out a new way to just kind of cut loose. And we had a great drummer and it was cool. And then, you know, we didn't, we didn't do that many shows. Um, 
it didn't, the band didn't last that long. <laughs> In fact, I think we made the record and didn't ever do any more shows, um, which is not, it's not atypical of how things have happened with Robert along the way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and also the thing was they were, it's funny that they're doing this whole <coughs> um, lockdown Sunday thing together where they're playing together because they, um, he, he and Toya, because it wasn't, uh, they were trying to figure out how to do, how to work together at the time. And, and um, sometimes it worked really smoothly and sometimes it didn't. And I felt like I was kind of in the middle of all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we made some really cool stuff and there's, there's, uh, um, I don't know what's going to happen with all these recordings, but, um, there's some cool outtakes and other stuff that didn't, didn't make it onto the record. Yeah. So Paul Beavis, who, who is he? He was, okay. So man, there's some, there's a couple of great stories about Paul. Um, but I, I, I won't, I won't tell them all. Paul Robert, Paul was a local drummer in, uh, I think in Bournemouth, uh, where, where, which is just south of where um, Robert and Toya were living. Paul played on, I believe it's the second um, Andy Summers Frip record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, I don't know who, Robert found him again and said, you know, come do this thing. So, yeah. And he's, he's gone on to play with, um, some pretty big English pop acts. Um, yeah. Um, he actually played, I don't even think I can tell this story anyway. He, he, uh, he played on, he played on some of Andy's, he, he, when the, when the police would do a record, each of the guys would go off and make demos and then bring them to the band. And he played on Andy's demos. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you the rest of the story yes. probably someday. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a, he was a sweet guy, and and I haven't seen him since. I think we had like uh, he still uh, he was teaching drums a lot, and um, I can't remember who he plays with now. But it's it's pretty uh, you know it's pretty big high profile. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think his drumming is is pretty amazing. It's really yeah yeah yeah. Super and there unique. was yeah yeah. Especially the, the 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 title track Sunday All of the World, we kind of hit the hit the nail on all of it, and, and Paul's drumming on that is is great. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. He was actually uh, it, it was interesting because I had had this this idea that um, basically Robert hated symbols mm -hmm. for like my twenty years leading up to to working with Robert, or not twenty years, but and um, when Paul started playing his symbols, I was like, oh shit. Robert's going to chew him an asshole. I don't know what's going to happen. And um, Robert loved his cymbal playing. He's like, you're, he's like, you, you do cymbals. You, you do the most awesome cymbals. And he, he even said his cymbal work on the, on the track Sunday, all over the world is like peak cymbal work. So. <laughs> hey, so, and the, the um, initial writing sessions were with Paul. Did you write? As a uh, yeah. 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 We would meet uh, well. Uh, we would meet in T Tony Arnold's uh, little studio, which was in a different town, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe. I really can't remember now which studio it was, but it was just some little place. Yeah, yeah. I th I think I bought your uh, raw power tape, the cassette that you had put out pretty early on. So I maybe just a year or so after. Uh, there it is. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. <laughs> and and uh, I still have a copy, and um it was pretty clear to me then which tracks came kind of like came from you because there are a couple pieces on the sunday uh there's the actually yeah album. these are some of these are actually essentially demos for um a, a couple of tracks transient joy we turned into yeah. something and yeah. uh and i just digitized all those and um uh just a little aside do you, do you know bill forth yeah i do of course so bill took years of 20 25 years ago, he took one of those tracks and sang over it. Mm -hmm. And it's just been sitting here forever. And then when I got, when I was digitizing, I found the original four tracks and I got the four tracks over. And then I found Bill's version. I was like, you know what? This is really good. And I wrote Bill and I was like, you should give me the, give me the vocal, you know, on its own and I'll remix it. And you know what? 
take all this other music from the this raw power thing and sing over all of it. And so that's what he's doing right now. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And your first solo album, which was um, all stick, right? Yeah. Uh, with, with, with drums and uh, percussion and your yeah. voice, your singing and, and also like uh, yeah. spoken, spoken word stuff. I, I still really like it because, because of that, the fact that you made the stick sound great. Mm. Right. Like, I think mm. that it's a really wonderful, wonderful piece of work. And, um, how did that kind of like come about? How did that fit in the timeline of, yeah. So what's, what's really great about that record is that, uh, we're talking about 1000 years is that it actually came, um, after the Sylvian Fripp record. Um, so I had, um, I just had a whole lot more experience, um, pretty much watching Dave, the, the two Davids, Bottrell and Sylvian, mm -hmm. how they, I guess we use the word produce, but, uh, but, mm -hmm. but it's more, it's really the sculpt is sculpt is the right word. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there was a lot of, um, putting lots of layers and then going back and erasing 90% of it. because we were on tape back then. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of did my best with that on the ADATs where, you know, erasing is pretty dodgy and sometimes you screw it up. You got to punch out. And, um, so, but I, but I, I, I feel like that record and, and there's some great stuff on it. There's some, some other okay stuff, but it still, it still holds up. Um, <clears throat> I feel like the, that if I had done it like two years earlier, it would have been something totally different, uh, but because of this, 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 um, really the sculpting process and, um, uh, that really helped that. And, and the thing that I was, I did a lot of singing earlier. And when I go back and listen to a lot of it, it's really, really hard for me, uh, to hear, but the thing that I really wanted to try to get on this was I've always wrestled with this um, this sense of the singer songwriter and not just with myself but just in general like there's the there's this um, vocal viewpoint of in, in, in a worst case scenario I'm going to tell you something you know and then the other is just look at me and but I still love the voice so I was kind of trying to figure out how to find ways to, to use the voice as a sound mm -hmm. and, and use the lyrics as um, evocative rather than um, narrative or diatribe or rhetoric. And, and so, yeah, yeah. And then there are a couple, there are a couple of, uh, that one I had a couple of extras, I had a couple of female singers that I knew at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm going to remix that. I've got I've got almost everything sorted out. There's a couple of places where I I I'm missing some parts, so I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, no, and I that was that was actually one of the first. I'm sure it wasn't the first record on ADATS, but it was one of the first. And even living in New York City, I thought I'm I'm making this in my little. I had like a little basically a closet in the back of the apartment. With a little a dat and i think i only had one maybe i had two a dats i can't remember mm -hmm. uh, and i thought well i'm gonna you know i'm gonna splurge and and take my tapes into a real studio and get them mixed by a real professional and i could only find two places in all of new york city there was one in new jersey that even had a dats and they weren't even they were just like little crappy demo studios. You know, I'm sure if the guy hears that, he'll he'll understand. It was like a 16 channel board with two ADATs. Mm -hmm. And we were, you know, still running through this kind of medium club level mixer board to, to mix. That was that was all you that's all all you could do. Yeah. So was, was so that's kind of my that's my interest for remixing it, really. Not not because I could make it because uh, I want to change anything just to just to clean it up. And, so was, was David Bottrell involved in no, mixing it? No, no, not that one. 
not that one. Okay. No, I mixed it in pieces. Even my friend Bob, percussionist who who made dangerous music and is married to Happy Roads and all, and we we worked for many many years in, in the in Trey Gun Band and stuff. He didn't even really have a. He went on to like make a big Neve studio in New, New York, but he had like a an eight track TAC and like a little mixer board. And one of the one of the pieces comes off of that. So there's this kind of cobbled together with eight ats and. I think one of the tracks I just mixed myself without even, I didn't even have any external reverb. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. The, you know, the one I, thing I that I was able to do was get a, 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 I did go to a mastering studio, but um, uh, the thing is the guy was uh, the new, it was like a new digital mastering system. And the guy was kind of new to it and he was more of a classical master. So the, the level is just insanely low on the original. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that, that'll get fixed. But you know the, the I think it's it's sort of an important record in a way because it brings together a few worlds that had not collided yet. So mm -hmm. it's like it's like what I was actually surprised I that Michael Brook was in the band when you guys played the sort yeah. of rap stuff. Yeah. And so your record has some of that, right? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And it has it has the uh, sort of like the progressive slash world kind of rhythm aspect mm -hmm. to it mm -hmm. it has mm -hmm. the chapman stick sounds and mm -hmm. it has the let's say like the fripp inspired soloing and also mm -hmm. harmonies mm -hmm. and and i think it's and, and the world, it's, world percussion too and the world percussion exactly and yeah. and it's sort of and the looping right the looping yeah. as well and so yeah. so it has like this um and that's why i i have to say maybe it's still my favorite record of yours mm. it's like just just the initial mood that each piece has like the atmosphere that kind of you know appears in the room when i put it on mm. is sort of like it's so immediate and it's so it's mm. it, it it also represents the meeting of the worlds that kind of like i was sort of like dreaming would would happen like being mm. a sylvian fan and you mm. know listening to david's solo stuff and then you know the King Crimson and everything kind of like comes together in that record beautifully. And I bought I bought it at a, at the Sylvian Fripp show uh, in in, oh, Holland, in Holland. That's right. They let me sell it at that show. Yes, it was. They only let us sell it at the, only at one show or on the whole. Uh, you know what? I think I think I might have had the only record in the merch thing because we weren't allowed to sell our own. We weren't allowed to sell the Sylvian Fripp record. <laughs> no, there was. I'm pretty sure there was um, um, the Robert Fripp string Quinn Tet, you're right and your record and yeah maybe the california guitar trio or something maybe so yeah yeah, yeah so like right. the first three dgm uh albums yeah yeah like <laughs> and and you know i think the thing about that record too and maybe that's part of the kind of excitement of it is i tried to uh i tried and i think successfully like got as many different things that you could do with the stick that I could do with it on it. You know, I processed it in all the possible ways that you could and try to just, you know, use it as use, use it as much as possible. Yeah, and you were doing like the percussive stuff on the pickup and, and yeah. all of that stuff. It yeah, it was, it was great. And yeah. probably, I mean, it's almost it's it's possible even looking at it, it may be that all those things that I did is still what I do. You know, just in a different, you know, just in a, in a different way. It's all it's all there. Sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. It is. Yeah. yeah. And this is this is something that we like as artists sometimes forget that we're not necessarily different now than we were twenty five years ago. Oh no, no. It's, no, it's no. like and, and it, but that also means that we we were already perfect in the sense back then right so yeah. like what we did back then was also valuable like and like i because i i sometimes have this problem that i still kind of like get into this vibe because you know like when people are skeptical about what i do then i start thinking okay i need to be better or i need mm -hmm. to do something different or mm -hmm. but i i've started to realize that that's wrong i mean like it's just that people don't get it or don't want to get it or whatever and it's fine right um or they yeah. just don't like it they just don't like yeah, it. yeah exactly 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 yeah and that's yeah. and and um but the, the the problem is that uh it's it's difficult you know like and i can certainly say that for me it's like i 
would like to be generally accepted, right? As a person, mm. to be seen yeah. as a person. And this is kind of like the, the, most of us have this, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and it's uh, um, in, in music, we, as people who create um, yeah, music or sound, it's it is as if it's like maybe the like the strongest mirror or 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 um what is the word uh catalyst right for emotions and for feedback and for for disappointment and for success and for happiness and joy but like yeah. also the other side and like, like navigating this uh, is uh is probably like one of the biggest challenges for you know, and I was, it's funny, I was thinking about this just last night because I came across a clip of a David Sylvian track on YouTube last night that I hadn't heard and it's pretty recent. Mm -hmm. And I had this exact feeling about David. Like I wondered if um, David feels exactly this. Mm -hmm. And I bet he does. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I, 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 I suppose, um, you know, we have this sense of these uh, these musical icons that just radiate so much confidence, and probably it's not true. I, I agree. I mean, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very probable. And you see, like in in David's work, you can see that he was uh, constantly trying to reinvent himself. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, and. Uh, but you know, I, I, one of the one of the real huge benefits of this uh, quarantine for me is going back through and digitizing all my recordings mm -hmm. and seeing like, um, well, first of all, how awesome the first recordings are. I mean, the I have the very first thing I ever made on four track with my drummer friend John Keating in Texas. When you guys hear this, it's fucking amazing. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it's. It's not, um, it's not mature, but there's like all this, uh, we just went a hundred percent into it, you know, with just four tracks and, and, uh, it's really, it's, it's really great. Um, but, um, looking at the overview and seeing like, uh, here's an early version of this idea and here it is again, and here it is again, 20 years later and is fascinating and even like this whole period is pretty shitty like one whole section of like several maybe five year period like okay it's all pretty not good not really not not once you step back and like man i feel embarrassed for uh, i feel embarrassed for myself and everyone who was there <laughs> and it's just that whole time period you know, but there's still the ideas or the ideas are still the same ideas. It's just something else is something else has changed. And then you see it come around and it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. You know, for me, the uh, playing with borrow time tape that I also had, which was before your stick time, you also have a copy there. <laughs> um, yep. <laughs> um, sort of like maybe is the best example or like for me like proof of what you said that when you discovered the stick it sort of like was the instrument for what you were composing in a way mm. if i mm. find that that album is a really good example like it already sounds like something that should have been played with a stick should have been played should have been played on our instrument yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. that I don't want to say I can say confidently that I will never re-record any of that on the instrument, mm -hmm. but I don't think I'll, I would ever do that. Somebody else can do that. But yeah, um, yeah, I agree. That's where, um, when was it? Oh, it's pretty. 85 or something. Yeah. So, you know, this is right before I met Robert. Mm -hmm. This one's right before I met Robert. And then um, this one. Yeah, the I, magic if was right after yeah. the second guitar craft, uh, uh, second level two course, and this one's obviously influenced by you know stuff that we did. This one, I bet you don't have that one. No, punishment farm's greatest. Farm's greatest, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ever 
everybody's going to get to hear this stuff eventually. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it is it is interesting to see those ideas. So eighty, I mean, the, the for me, the, the that's what's weird about being older and looking back. That eighty five to eighty seven was when I was playing the stick with Sunday all over the world, and that's eighty five. There, there, it's like a different unit. Same, similar, but like so much change, so much change in there. Yeah. In, in only a couple of years. It's, um, yeah. 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 I, I wonder if that um, could still be the case for us at an advanced age, right? Like maybe, maybe it's the same, but we don't really see it that clearly anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would be happy if the last thing I recorded is as good as the first thing I did in 1978. <laughs> that would be an awesome way to go out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Hey, and and um, I spoke with uh, Robert Fraza also for one of these. Yeah, movies. I saw that. I haven't gotten to watch that yet, but I, I, I really want to check it out because I realized that I spent so much time around Fraza, but there's actually, I, I, there's a lot of things I don't know about him. You know, that's why I wanted to talk with him because like nobody knows much about him. <laughs> so, but, uh, but anyway, like he said that, um, so just continuing the timeline a little bit, if you work with, with Robert. Um, mm -hmm. So he said that you guys had a session um, for what was supposedly, um, you know, was supposed to become King Crimson with Jerry. I mean, yeah. that's, that's something that was kind of like already uh, even like published back then in a, in a newspaper I, or in a magazine, I seem to remember. Was that just the three of you? Do you remember? Uh, what the, the way the timeline worked was that we, we the, the Sylvian Fripps project had started with just David and Robert and I originally. We did a couple of tours in Japan yeah. and, and uh, in Italy. And then when it came time to make the record, um, they wanted to bring in a drummer and, and I don't know, flush things out. So we had set up a rehearsal time and I have it as in my memory where in, in dreamland, but we might've been in Applehead, which is, I think yeah. Robert was running, uh, we, to go there and re rehearse with David and Jerry and Robert and David had a visa problem and couldn't get into the country. Oh. Mm -hmm. So Robert and Jerry and I played for the week mm -hmm. and I have tapes of all of that. It's freaking great. Um, and of course we played through this, the few things that we had with David, but we couldn't really go very far with it without David. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the songs were pretty short and uh, you know, it needed, it needed kind of massaging. So Robert just started pulling out Crimson ideas and other ideas that we've been floating around. I have, you know what else I have? Right here, mofos. Look at these tapes. That's tapes of just Robert and I playing in my little closet. Wonderful. Um, anyway, uh, so, so I think we just started playing ideas with Jerry and then, um, then the next thing that happened was I don't think we ever even rehearsed with Jerry and David. I think we just booked the Dreamland and went in and arranged there. Uh, so then, uh, when Robert was wanting to start up Crimson, the idea was we're, we'll do it with Jerry. And then uh, this was after the, the Sylvian Fripp tour and everything. So then we we met as a five piece and. You know, I was in such kind of shock to be in the room with Tony and Adrian and, uh, you know, the, the, and Jerry still. I mean, I, Jerry's such a warm guy, but his, his history for me was almost um, just more daunting than the Crimson guys because of the Peter Gabriel records. And, yeah. and, uh, but he was so sweet to me. I was always asking Jerry, like, am I, am I playing behind the beat? Am I, you know, how am I doing? He's like, ah, you're fine. Mm -hmm. the other guys i'm worried about <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um but um yeah then we then we met as a as a five piece and i to be honest i think we didn't even play 30 minutes and robert was already this isn't this isn't right mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I think we played, we, we had two days of rehearsal, something like that. And that, that evening, um, Robert, I don't know, he, called, he came into the kitchen or something because we were staying in the house and he was cool, probably the most distraught I've ever seen him. Mm -hmm. Like what, do, I think he was doubly distraught because this wasn't working and he knew that he was going to have to go for two drummers. <laughs> And even that concept was just terrifying to him. He was like, you know, what do we do? I was like, I think we better call. He's like, I think it's Pat and Bill. I was like, who do I call first? And I think I, I was like, I think you better check in with Pat first. So, yeah. so I remember, just remember the detail that I want to uh, ask you about. So um, some of the, of the first day record has Jerry's drumming and some tracks only have drum loops yeah and and so and just tell me if i'm wrong but i heard that there was some sort of like falling out between david and and jerry at some point in the studio right probably yeah. right so yeah. Yeah. so what i found funny and i tell me if that's maybe related to the falling out does it say in the credits on the first day um uh, jerry marotta drums and cowbell or something <laughs> I don't know. If it does, <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> well, the funny, the funny part of the story is um, that, I mean, there's lots of funny parts. And of course, all of this, this is just Trey's memories. I, it, could be, yeah. it could be wrong and everybody has other perspectives. But yeah. the funny thing was that uh, somewhere in that session, Jerry was kind of conferring about, and Jerry's a huge David Sylvian fan. I mean, for him... Brilliant Trees is one of the, the top records ever made. Um, yeah. So huge respect for Dave and I'm really happy to be there. And, and I think he was like inquiring with, or maybe he, maybe when he was set up his drumming, he put a cowbell there and, and David came and said, you know, there's only two, basically there's only two things I hate, four on the floor and cowbell. And I feel like Jerry just right at then picked up the drums and started doing both at the same time. <laughs> or at least it was like a joke between us in between things. He would just, he would just, play around with that so i don't know i have to check the credits i don't think there's there's probably not cowbell on the record there might be actually. there is there is there is there is yeah. well you know he did jerry just did some of the most inventive stuff inside that music that you'd almost not really even notice mm -hmm. um you know he did you know we did what we basically we had these very short little tunes um uh 20th century dreaming was called splatology at the time and firepower were basically we played them as a trio without drums and you know they were like three minute tunes mm -hmm. and we would play them in the studio and then nobody was ready for the song to be over so then we would just go into what ended up being these extended codas mm -hmm. and um the the first one the firepower jerry basically plays a regular kind of a soul groove but he puts he starts the groove on the and of two instead of one and i'm the one holding the groove and freaking brilliant it's freaking brilliant and really hard to i mean i really was on the edge of my seat like trying to hold it together so and there may be cowbell on that as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i i think his drums sound really great on that record and like yeah like all yeah. the all the detail he puts into those jams like which keeps them like even the, the polyrhythmic stuff like so groovy yeah. and so it's it's, yeah. it's 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 great and it's kind of it's kind of it's to me still so interesting that Pat ended up playing the tour, right? So, yeah, and, uh, and you know what's really funny too is that when Pat came to the do the auditions, he had learned the music so well, much better than we knew it. Mm -hmm. um, and he had learned, Jerry had done a couple of like um, uh, poly, polymetric um, like cymbal overdubs. Mm -hmm. Pat didn't Pat just thought that was the drum part. So he had learned the whole playing the beat on starting at two and a half. And then, um, then also like this three on the, you know, which, okay, nowadays it's not quite over the top, but at the time that was a totally over the top thing to do. And he just like, oh, I hear the drums doing that. So I'm just going to learn that. Yeah. yeah. So, so did you, well, you probably know, but um, Pat told me that it was actually Bill Forth. Like, like, uh, so Pat went to buy a rotary speaker or something from Bill Forth, and then Bill told him about the the audition. Oh, the auditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 
there's there's Bill Forth again. There we go. Great one, Bill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, one wonderful stuff, Trey. I mean, there's there's so so if if that first session there with with Jerry and King Crimson only lasted thirty minutes, then it doesn't really make sense to ask this question. And I was just wondering if if any of the music that then you know a, appeared on the Vroom EP, if if stuff if that was already around then yeah oh it definitely was was. yeah i have i have um i have recordings of us playing through vroom uh well i have i have robert and i playing it as duo before Mm -hmm. there was any and then i have jerry um jerry and robert and i and the form is pretty much there i didn't um we didn't have um uh, uh, Tony's fretless melodic lines in the middle of the fairy mm-hmm. finger mm-hmm. section. Mm-hmm. I wasn't doing that. I was still trying to figure out like what the hell to do in that section. So, mm-hmm. uh, but we have versions of Vroom and um, maybe that's it. Vroom, Vroom was the Vroom was the 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 the, the nose of the rocket. That whole that whole yes that yeah. whole track record. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. So man, like I'm, I, I know that you only have like 90 minutes, right? Or yeah, I got another 20, 20, you got, 20. got another 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So because it, it seems like maybe we have to uh, talk again at some point because That's fine. <laughs> there's, there's so be much, cool. there's, there's so much stuff I, I want to ask you about. So um, the Robert Fripp string quintet. Yeah. How yeah. does that fit into the timeline? You know, it's, you it's right around the same time. It was, um, is it after Sylvian? It is. It's after Sylvian, but before Crimson. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I don't even know how it started, to be honest. I think it may have, it, 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 it may have been initiated um, because we started going to Japan again. Robert had... It's funny when I when I first went to Japan with Robert and um, with David Sylvian as a trio, he said, "How old was I at the time? Thirty-three? Um, he said, "Oh, you're ahead of me." And I was like, "What are you kidding? You had like a hit record when you were nineteen. And he said, "Well, I didn't get to go to Japan until I was forty. <laughs> like, huh? Okay, well, if you think I'm ahead of you, then I mean, that makes me feel good. But, um, but then we, he, so he hadn't been to Japan since like '85, and so now we started. To, and and I, I suspect it's possible that the, the trio might have been born out of him being invited to go to Japan, and and he was like, well, let's let's uh, let's bring Trey and, and and the trio and see what we can do together. And um, you know, it's such an interesting project. I, 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 I feel like I, can, I mean, a lot of people really like it. I feel like I can say it was successful in other ways. Maybe the unsuccessful part to me is just unrealized potential. Mm-hmm. Like we were kind of, you know, and, and but um, I loved playing the, the Bach pieces with the trio. I mean, for me, that was just an awesome treat and we didn't um i don't think we record there's a couple i played with them and we didn't get them all recorded there but um the Pasicalia, and then there was oh contrapunctus i don't think the con is it con- have you heard the contrapunctus from the art of the fugue i i'm trying to remember if it's on there i think it is i don't i don't think it is no? um you know which one I'm talking about, but the, the, the bass is, it's not the Pasacalia. Um, it's from the Art of the Fugue, and it's yes, one I of think, the... I think, I think it's, on the, it's on the album. Okay, there, all right. So, um, on which supposedly is a studio album, which I think it was recorded live, right? Right, okay. So, well, e- either way, I, I, I've always loved and been playing Bach on the piano since I was a small child, and to be able to... I mean, probably for me, that's probably what really opened up the instrument was being able to, I mean, Bach is just the king daddy of the melodic line and, and mm-hmm. it works on every instrument, but it really works on the fifths tuning. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it probably, it's not just because he wrote so much for violin and cello, it's just the, the lines are just the lines and they're such a crazy 
in their logic. So being able to play that stuff and have to uh, deal with your instrument and figure out, you can't, you can't, um, you know, with the rock stuff, the, the improv and stuff we do, you know, you can, you can make up your fingerings on the fly. Mm -hmm. if you need to, or you can change, you know, I'll change like, oh, this finger's not doing so great tonight. I'll use this one or <laughs> it doesn't sound, you know, I'll, I'll do this, but with that box shit, you can't do that at all. You got to, you got to figure out the best fingering and practice it. And so that was really awesome. And um, just memorizing that shit. Um, the possibility. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, I, it sounds pretty awesome on that on that record, I think. And yeah, it's like yeah. such such a powerful rendition of that piece where it really kind of like shows the uh, the other side like of that music that's never really represented when classical players play it. Yeah, it can rock. It can totally rock. Yeah. 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 And a lot of that's, I mean, that's coming from Bert, Bert, uh, Bert Lamb's uh, initiative there. But, you know, with the trio, you have this kind of, uh, you, they come as a thing. They're like a, they're like a single thing, even though it's three of them. So mm -hmm. they kind of uh, made a core to the project that, that Robert and I could fit in and around. And uh, it was cool. It's cool. And I think we often, did we also like end the show with Urban Landscape that we used to do with David Sillian? Super bleak, chromatically dissonant landscape. Yes. Is that on the record? Yeah, there's there's one on the record, but there's also this bootleg, this Japanese bootleg that has yeah, a whole yeah. show. And there's yeah. like three of those uh, soundscape tracks and yeah. they're, they're awesome. Like super, they like really part of my musical DNA. Yeah, putting that, language. playing that stuff in, you know, we used to do, we we would do with, with, with David Sylvian, when it was just the trio, when it was the five piece, we didn't do this, but with the trio, we would end the show with Urban Landscape. And, um, you know, I would set up the, the, the initial uh, hovering sound of the, the minor third, but with the major seventh, and that it, no fifth. And then Robert would start his chromatic thing, and then David would do all his weird shit. And it was bleak, <laughs> you know, it was bleak. But the thing is, it, it worked because you're there with Robert and David. But when we would do that, when we went to do the the, um, the, 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 the string quintet, and the Japanese audience, you could just see like, they had just seen us with David Sylvian and, and beautiful David and beautiful David's voice. And now here we're doing urban landscape with these, these dorky guys on stage. And there was, there felt, felt like there was confusion in the room. <laughs> and then that's the end of the show. I mean, I think we, we probably had a little, like a little kicker encore after it, but yeah. Yeah, but, you know, but I think that has been maybe the, why I, I I like the you know the King Crimson family let's say, or some parts of it so much because there was sometimes this 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 uh, braveness to to go to a place that is as you say bleak or even brutal or aggressive and sort of like uh, taking taking into account the. Uh, the twentieth century, really. yeah, yeah, and 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 that that I thought was kind of like really, that was also kind of like the direction that like I wanted the band to go, right? mm. which didn't mm. quite happen, but but that was that was really what what was so interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, and with the, with the string quintet, actually, we didn't call it urban landscape. I remember now, Trinity for souls and torment. Yeah, but the urban landscape is also there. Yeah. On that. Okay. Yes, well. I know. Threnody. Yeah. Exactly. And that and that piece is also on that um, on that album that DJM put out. And it's, it's right. Awesome. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Also, it's it's um. I feel like um. You know, it's funny. It's funny. This 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 uh, reference just pops into my head, and and I'll explain why. But um, there's like um. There's like happy-go-lucky entertainment, and then there's like pseudo dark, and then there's real dark. And for me, the Lord of the Rings kind of is similar because it embodies like so many different aspects of narrative and story, and the darkness is fucking real. 
Mm-hmm. It's like really, you know, and, and born out of World War One and World War Two. And 20th century is a tough, it's a tough cookie. It is. It is. So, you know, it is, it is, it, 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 it it's cool and it, it, it's cool to play in there. Risky because people may not go with you, but if you've already lured them in, you might as well. You know, it's the it's the healing powers really of yeah. that kind of music. And and really I was I was aware of that effect probably first with David Sylvian's work, where I was when I first started listening to it, I was maybe 16, 17 or something like that. And listening to this music that was so apparently like to me at least sad. Mm, right, mm. Uh, melancholy kind of like, and on purpose, but, on purpose, yeah. and me like listening to it and then realizing, okay, it made me sad. But after listening to uh, Boy with the Gun, right, <laughs> I felt great, right. like, like it was, it really, I, I really experienced that, like, uh, you know, l- really uh, letting myself in for the ride was extremely, extremely helpful and extremely, um cathartic that's the word Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and and that's also why i think uh, in a way if we have the opportunity to be on stage and you know we we have this power a little bit of power to give people an experience of catharsis right like why not and even if it's just that one loud wrong note that you play in a solo you know Mm -hmm. and and i've 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 always um, kind of like seen um, like it's like the, the projects which we probably won't get to today like but <laughs> sort of like was really um, uh, super crazy I mean was that was that actually I, I mean I, I can't imagine like how that came about how that music came about but and I, I've, I seem to remember that um, you know like these motifs um, that you develop between uh, Robert and you, the uh, this uh, symmetrical scale stuff that was right. Um, that was just so out of out of out of the popular culture. It was just mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. ridiculously wrong, let's say. Mm-hmm. And then you guys went with it, and I think yeah, that... it's interesting. It's wrong, but. You could also say it comes right from Stravinsky, which is a hundred years old. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you, I mean, you know, when I say wrong, I obviously yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know, what, I know what you mean. Uh, but then also, like, like uh, this, this, uh, the whole um, environment, let's say, mm. in which that music was presented, was just it was just radical. Mm. Like, like uh, at, being at the jazz cafe and and those improvs, like it was just so kind of like it. I really think that that a new style of music was born there. Mm. And yeah, like that. A yeah. lot of a lot of uh, contemporary jazz you hear kind of like comes from that spirit somehow. And yeah. th- there's yeah. probably the, may, plenty parallel developments, but. Um, I still think that was that was really important, and you know, like for me, like seeing you, the eight string instrument there, like coming jumping back to the touch guitar, and and you sort of like using that instrument either as a bass or a keyboard instrument with the MIDI sounds even and the lead sounds, the soaring lead sounds, and um, almost like more like using the instrument like a like a flute in that mm. regard, right? Um, that was in a way you were the one the one guy who, who had like every, all this all the sub elements of the band in in one person mm. like you were the glue and sort of mm. and i don't know if that was something like that you experienced it that way but it was as if you you had to sort of had mm. to uh, connect there to that guy you had to connect to that guy and you had Absolutely. to connect to the other guy so in order to to uh, to make this work also spiritually i don't know if, if you would agree with that but but that's sort of like what i felt was your role was and you being also the the, the youngest right yeah 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 that no absolutely absolutely and 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 you're right there's probably a lot more to talk about the, the the projects than we we have time for now but um that was kind of why i wanted to consolidate the instrument down to to eight strings and have it 
um, have um, have more of those uh, those. Uh, for me, it was all about blending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which interestingly is the is the main element of a keto. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, but, but like to be able to have all these different roles, but be able to jump to them very quickly to me just didn't make sense to have two separate groups of strings yeah. and all these different sounds, you know, that it, it just, I, I wanted, um, I don't know, I wanted like, like you have the whole keyboard and it just flows from one roll to the other across the whole thing. There were different sounds, you know, but, but, but um, yeah, I mean, that was the trick, you know, how do you play with this guy and then how do you, with this guy it's a different thing you know the, 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 these different personalities just between tony and robert you know or, mm -hmm. or, or adrian and robert and so yeah that that flexibility like the, i don't know what you call it floating point maybe i was the floating point <laughs> yeah but really really my compliments because i think that you really made that whole thing work and 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 I, you know, it's kind of like speaks for me for this universal musicianship that I yeah. think is something that we kind of strive for, right? Like yeah. it's, it's not a, just about playing. It's, it's about the production. It's about the sculpting as you call it. Right. It's, yeah. it's, and it's, it's about, it's also about the physical aspect of playing. It's, it's about understanding a polyrhythm. It's, yeah. it's about ear training. Listening and performance and performance as an art right and on all these aspects that kind of like and and this is sort of um sort of like the um in a way like like anachronistic kind of version of what people were to become in the 90s and 2000s right mm -hmm. like where where like the the image was was still and it's changed now, but where it was like you're only allowed to be good at one thing, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean, yeah. Yeah? And, yeah, yeah, and and yeah. so 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 I that that's sort of like that was kind of like the whole vibe of it. And I mean, what we should also like, okay, now you go for it. Well, I was going to say, I wonder how much of that came from uh, the industry defining what musicians are, as mm -hmm. opposed to letting the music just go you know when you listen back to the early 60s i know it's hard for a lot of people to not hear the 60s mm -hmm. sounds but if you listen to uh, some of the music there was this the musicians just gave the music freedom to do all sorts of crazy shit that people don't do nowadays mm -hmm. they feel constrained you know so yeah. that's yeah no no you're, you're right and i think uh the word industry is correct i think it's the under industrialization itself yeah um that created the worker as mm. the worker in the factory not the worker to, working need... at, on a farm right it's not the guy yeah. on a farm who like when you don't have work you just walk to the next farm and you work there right so it is this idea like you go to that one factory you get you know you start at eight in the morning you, you know like you have everything is laid out for you you get your money uh every two weeks or every four weeks or whatever and you you do that for 45 years and then you retire and a few years later you die and, right. and you know that that has been like kind of the moment and you're doing one you're doing a specific task yes oh, yeah. only that one specific task and 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 sort of that obviously has has been such a kind of like um, a blueprint for people's lives and also mm. for for what people are allowed to do right mm. and and I'm, I'm so killer. yeah i'm so i'm so glad that like i think that we're over that as mm. uh, you know well not completely but i think humanity has moved on from that a little there's bit. A, certainly least. the option to not do that is there yes <laughs> yeah, yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah but I, I find it interesting that music sort of is almost almost always if you're looking at um um you know the the history um is always a little bit of a precursor mm -hmm. right like at the same time you could say okay the music is a result of the worldview and the historical events and stuff like that but 
but I also think the other way around. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, that's what, you know, we could get even more esoteric, but the, 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 a, a, a creative action is, it's, it's, it's the other way. It's not the result. It's the, it's the, it's, yeah. it's the impetus of it, you know, yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. whoever's, whoever, who's, who's the bravest to run with it. You know, yeah. that's, 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 you know. Yeah. Okay, Trey. So let's, let's stop here for today. And um, yeah, shit. Uh, we did, just, we only got, we only got to the mid nineties, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, uh, it's yeah. really interesting. It's really interesting to look back and look at it with a different perspective. Yeah, and I, I know that you've done uh, a few interviews recently where you were going into the past, but I. Uh, it's not like this because you because we know each other and and uh, okay. people don't know the instrument that well. I I really enjoyed talking with Shane. I got to say, do you know him at all? Yeah, yeah. Uh, fucking great player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, let's uh, try to talk again in a few days, maybe, and um, then I, I can, you know, release this as two episodes or whatever. Let's... People can spend their whole night <laughs> looking at our faces. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, but let's talk about that next time. But I, I also want to get into into this conversation of like why I'm in a position to actually even have to do something like this, right? Right. It's, it's right. sort of like the recent developments and, and, and shit okay yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay cool. thanks man yeah all right we'll talk soon yep bye for now trey all right cheers thanks. Bye.